my name is Daniel Debo. I'm the director of science operations at the Canada France Hawaii telescope. And today I'll talk to you about uh, the capabilities of our telescope, uh, uh, which goes from uh, wide field imaging to uh, high resolution uh, spectropolarimetry and uh, through uh, Fourier transform uh, spectro imaging. So <laughs> that sounds really complicated, but uh, I will uh, get this going. Okay, so first let me introduce the observatory for you. So it's a 3.6 meter telescope located uh, at the summit of Mauna Kea. So you can see here a picture of the inside and uh, here for scale, you can see um, uh, some of our staff here discussing some things that I'm sure are really interesting. Um, okay, whoops. So we have two prime focus instruments. It's the, basically the wide field portion uh, of the observatory. So the first one is called WearCam. So it's an infrared imager, 20 by 20 uh, arc minutes, 128 megapixels. You have the filter set there. Uh, the second one, uh, the second wide field imager we have is MegaCam. And I uh, encourage you to uh, see uh, Heather Fluelling, Dr. Heather Fluelling's talk uh, on this. Uh, gives you a lot of details on, on this camera. And uh, the, our wide field imaging is, is used to study the, the deep universe, but also uh, exoplanets and uh, also asteroids. We also have, uh, and I'll get into a, a little more details uh, later. So we also have a tree Cosgrain focused uh, instrument. So you can uh, see here that uh, the instrument that Megacam or Wicam used to be at the primary focus is now replaced by a mirror and the instrument itself is located here at the bottom uh, of the telescope. So uh, the first uh, Cosgrain focus instrument is Espadon, a high resolution uh, fiber fed spectropolarimeter. So it, it, uh, it's uh, in two parts. So you have here uh, the polarimetry unit, which is at the Cosgrain focus. And here you have the instrument itself, uh, which is located uh, at the bottom uh, of the of the telescope, at the uh, I'm sorry, on the third floor of the telescope. Uh, the second instrument is a Cetel, so it's an, an 11 by 11 um, arc minutes uh, imaging Fourier transform spectrograph. So <laughs> what it does, it uh, sorry, it takes uh, images Fourier tra it takes images of fringes, and then you have to Fourier transform them to get a cube. And I'll get into a little bit more details with that later. Uh, <clears throat> our latest baby, it's called a Spirou. So it's a higher resolution uh, near infrared spectral polarimeter uh, and velocimeter. And uh, we still have a one meter per second goal. We haven't given up on that. We're not quite there yet. We're at about the best numbers I've seen. We're about one to 1.5 around 1.2, 1 1.5 uh, meters per second. And it helps uh, do science for the detection and also the characterization uh, of uh, exoplanets. Uh, the instrument started normal operations in uh, February, 2019. So it's still uh, brand new. And uh, we're still uh, working out the kinks. So here's our suite of instrument. So you have them all here, Cosgrain and primary focus. And all of them are operated in QSO mode. So what does that mean? Is that what that means is that uh, nobody goes up to the telescope anymore. We're all we have an operator that's down here in Waimea and operates the, the telescope at the summit of the uh, of Mauna Kea. Everything is done remotely. There's absolutely uh, nobody in the dome uh, at night. We also have Graces. Just quickly, there. This is a collaboration between uh, Gemini and us. So it's called GRACES, stands for the Gemini Remote Access to CFHT Espadon Spectrograph. So it's a pretty cool concept. It's a, it's a fiber link that goes from Gemini. So Gemini captures the light and send it something like uh, 300 meters away through 300 meters of fiber uh, to Espadon on the third floor of the instrument. I won't go too much into that, but these were uh, uh, numbers. That's the one here that I like is the signal to noise ratio 
per resolution uh, element for one hour expo exposure, uh, which brings it down to 20 magnitude, uh, which opens the extragalactic case uh, to s metal. It's a uh, it's pretty powerful instrument and it's, uh, it's being run also uh, uh, quite a bit uh, by Gemini. So the users uh, like it, good science productivity. So here's the number of publications. So a graph that's dear to all directors of science across the world. Uh, here's uh, the number of papers here as a function of the year. And here's 2020, which is uh, our highest year. And I'm, I'm not done counting the papers. I think we have something like 230 papers this year. So for a, a four meter, honestly, that competes with a bunch of eight meters at the summit of Mauna Kea, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, we can see here our uh, relative uh, scientific impact. These are, this is an old graph. Uh, this is something that's compiled by uh, Dennis Crabtree every two, two years or so. So that's the 2017 one. And you can see here, safe HD, uh, right, right. Um, right after Keck for uh, science productivity. And all the red ones are all the Mauna Kea ones. And you can see that Mauna Kea is quite productive in terms of science. So I'm gonna skip over that. So CFHD right now, it has the science impact of its history. And when people tell me that uh, the observatory is old, I tell them she's in her prime. I'm very sorry to say that's a 40-year-old observatory, but we're we're uh, we're really producing a lot of good science every year. Uh, so here I I did that a few years ago. We had an H index of uh, 122 with 3,400 papers. I think now we're at something like 3,700 papers. I haven't had a look at the H index though. So some of the science done with the instruments, uh, I will go quickly on that. Uh, so Omega Cam, uh, Heather's uh, talked to us about this uh, earlier. Uh, we do a lot of science with Mega Cam. It's a very used instrument. Uh, it's used, uh, it was used for, to do the CFHTLS, the legacy survey. And uh, a lot of science has and still coming out of this survey. It is incredible how much archival and catalog science also uh, comes out of this survey. Of this survey. Uh, we also have uh, past large programs, PANDAS and GBS, ASOS. These are all the names of the programs, but uh, mostly extragalactic. ASOS was a, uh, uh, a nice um, uh, solar system program that um, uh, <clears throat> try to find extreme, uh, found extreme Kuiper belt objects. And actually uh, their models show that uh, the distribution of uh, these extreme Kuiper belt is, should be fairly uh, uniform. Uh, and that's in, uh, in contrast with uh, people that claim that there's a, a gigantic uh, planet or black hole or whatever over there. And, uh, there's some of these uh, programs. So right now, the ongoing ones, the CFIS program, which is a, uh, a program that's um, a complement uh, to Euclid that will be launched uh, soon, I think. And Vestige also, uh, tracing the ionized gas in Virgo. First time uh, Virgo's image uh, that wide in uh, narrowband in H-alpha. Uh, here's a, an example of one of the results uh, of the uh, ATLAS large program. So one of the things that uh, uh, MegaCam can do really well is low surface brightness observations. These, uh, this type of galaxy here with ring around it uh, has been found quite a bit uh, using uh, the, with the MATLAS program. They've imaged several of them. And there was a talk, uh, the Gruber Bryce talk, that has an explanation, a merger explanation for these. They actually are able, in the illustrious um, uh, simulations, which simulate the whole universe, uh, to reproduce these. They see those, and when they look at their history, uh, it's it's uh, due to merger these these shells, these 
well, these, um, these galaxies have a high merger rate. Uh, here's more example of LSB here. You see in the Virgo uh, cluster here in GBS, you can see all these structures here. This is all real. Uh, this is all matter that's in between galaxies that uh, can be detected with Megacam. Here's more example. I won't uh, spend too much time on that. Also, one of my uh, favorite programs is uh, really mining the galaxies for the mold me most metal, metal poor stars it's called the pristine survey. So they design their own filters. Something you can do at CFHT is that if you design your filter and you pay for it, we're going to put it on the telescope. And if you have an accepted program, uh, we'll use it. And uh, that's what they did here, uh, the CHK filter that in, uh, here that's shown in contrast to the CO filter, I think. And uh, that really isolates uh, the CHK lines and helps uh, better uh, spot these uh, low metal city, uh, these metal poor stars. I won't uh, go too much into the details here due to the lack of time. Uh, with where CAM, we've had some large programs. Uh, a program that just finished is the Parallax uh, uh, Brown Dwarf uh, mapping program, and uh, they did a really good job of. Uh, uh, doing astrometry on these stars. And one of the things that came out of this is uh, that they think they've, they've set a, a brown dwarf mass limit of 70 uh, Jupiter masses, not set, but found using uh, their technique, which is a pretty cool result. So Cetel here, uh, just a quick word on uh, this instrument. So it has a field of view, it's a very powerful instrument, it has a field of view of 11 by 11 arc minutes. Uh, a pixel size of uh, 0.32 arc seconds. The wavelength range here is from 350 to 900 nanometers. And this wavelength range is really the range at which you get an image. So each and every pixel of the image is a spectrum. So the final um, data product that the scientists get is a cube with a spectrum at each pixel. And it's quite powerful. You get a lot of data. Uh, so we tested the resolution all the way up to 9,600. So the resolution can be varied, uh, but just by varying uh, the, the, the path between the two mirrors, which uh, Citel used, I forgot to mention, it's based on a Michelson interferometer, basically. And you, you vary the distance between the two mirrors and uh, you get your fringes. And that's what we record. So here's an example of a cube. You have a, a, a two spatial directions in a spectral direction. And after data reduction, uh, you get you know, emission lines all over the place. And uh, you can do all sorts of nice things. Uh, we have a large program on Satel right now. It's called the Star Formation Ionized Gas and Nebular Abundances Legacy Survey Signals, as PI is one of our resident astronomers, uh, Laurie rousseau Neptun. And 54 nights were awarded, and this program is uh, uh, keeps on going. One interesting result that uh, we got from this is this year, uh, NG, uh, <clears throat> some uh, somebody image, and that was done during commissioning, I think, or science verification. Uh, we image NGC 1275, and uh, we could you can see here in H alpha all these filaments, and they're very bright in H alpha but not in uh, other wavelengths. So that's a pretty impressive uh, result. The goal of the paper was to see if there's infall of material or outflow of material uh, inside the galaxy. And here uh, you can see a velocity map. This is uh, uh, one thing you can, uh, you can do. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, this is an H alpha map and this is an uh, uh, H alpha over N2 map. And here's the velocity map. Uh, so, uh, one thing you can do with Satel is have velocity because you have all the emission lines. And if you calcul calculate their shift uh, with respect to their rest wavelength, uh, you'll get a velocity. And uh, the hope was uh, to either get an inflow or an outflow. And basically, uh, uh, <coughs> they got um, uh, cha chaotic behavior all over the place. There's no real inflow or outflow. It goes all over the place. That just shows the power of the instrument. And um, last, uh, no, not last, before last, uh, Espadon, which is a high resolution uh, 
uh, fiber fed spectropolarimeter. So this is the type of science you can do with this type of instrument. You can literally map the surface of a star, uh, the spots on the surface of the star, and you also, you, by mapping the magnetic field, and uh, it's very complicated technique, but it works really well, and it gives a very uh, impressive results. Here's, I think that's the detection of a, uh, a planet around a star. I can't remember the exact details, but this is up here, this is the raw signal. And here this is a signal without uh, taking into account the polarimetry. And then if you, if you take the polarimetry out, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is the signal that you get um, with, with the, the, the planet. And these, I think here, these are the residuals. But I, I may be wrong on that. But the thing, the idea is that you're using the magnetic field to take out the, what we call the astrophysical noise from the star, which is, you know, a, a, a spot on the star can be mistaken for a planet uh, around the star. And uh, polarimetry is a, a really good way of reducing that noise. So the same kind of capability is uh, also available with uh, Spirou. And uh, Spirou is uh, literally uh, uh, trying to detect and characterize uh, planets around low mass uh, M dwarfs mostly. Uh, and here uh, you can have a QR code if you wanna go to the large program uh, that we're uh, doing uh, on this instrument. So it's the Spirou Legacy Survey. We're on, ongoing, 300 nights allocated. So with uh, five instruments operated in the QSO mode, CFHT offers a wide range of science capabilities. Uh, wide field imaging also offers the possibility to study uh, the deep and uh, the, as well as the nearby universe. I haven't talked about uh, the collaboration that we have with uh, Pan Stars, uh, where we follow up their discovery. Uh, and Megacam is really the best instrument to do that. It's really hard to catch a, a uh, an asteroid for the second time if you don't have a, a, a field of the size of a um, of mega cam and this helps lowering the error bars because when when you detect a new uh, a new asteroid or a new body or a new near Earth object you need to uh, map it several times map its orbit several times so you have a better idea of uh, what its orbit is and you're lowering the error bars on the orbit itself and uh, I will stop here. So that was for a different talk. So I will stop right here.